Uh, so I actually think I'm going to introduce our next two speakers at the same time. I was kind of thinking about how I wanted to introduce them, and I realized that I was kind of give them the same introduction. Um, so John Palameni is going to give the next talk, and then after that, Anastasia Yandiki will give her talk. Um, and I was kind of trying to think what I wanted to say about each of them, and I really wanted to say the same thing, which is that it's been a privilege to watch them come to MGH and grow into world-class scientists. You know, they came, each came with a background in something, you know, visual neuroscience or, or observer theory, um, and dove into their fields of study, you know, as deep as they could possibly go. You know, if you, if you want to know anything about high field imaging and how it can go wrong, you should ask John. He knows, you know, everything about how to mess up an MR scan and how to fix it if it's messed up. Um, combined with a deep knowledge of human anatomy and human, human brain function and visual field representations. And Anastasia is similar. You know, she, she came and she took on diffusion MRI and she had a background in kind of image formation and now thoroughly understands how images are formed on an MR scanner. But she's also done, you know, injection studies in monkeys and has looked at things under microscopes uh, and thoroughly understands, you know, everything from how the images are formed to how the anatomy is shaped. Uh, to how we can analyze that data. And so it really has been great to have them both at MGH. And so it's great to have them here today. Good, John. Well, gosh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Very happy to be here. Oh, whoops. <laughs> I should point out is the laser going off? Okay. Maybe it's not the laser. Okay. Yeah, so it does look, this one does work if you need. Uh, so while we're getting the projector set up, I just want to, again, thanks uh, to Bruce for the very kind introduction. Uh, very happy to be here. I'm very pleased to be participating in this symposium. It's been a lot of fun so far. I have to say that I've been a big fan and kind of enthusiastic user of Fuser for, for many years. It's, <laughs> it's kind of funny, though, because I have to say that I think a lot of us sort of take FreeSurfer for granted. It just works. You know, it gives us all of these surfaces. It gives us these segmentations. We can rely on them. And, you know, for me, who, uh, FreeSurfer has been such an integral part of my work. I really couldn't have done these work uh, on high-resolution fMRI without it. But again, it's kind of phenomenal that it just sort of exists and we can rely on it. And, uh, okay, so let me, <laughs> I can give Anastasia's talk if... Uh, <laughs> Okay, cool. Thanks, Allison. Okay, it's a Mac, so we have to give it a little bit of extra time. Great. Cool. Uh, <laughs> I guess everyone will have to kind of crane their heads over to the left in order to... <laughs> it keeps crashing. Uh-oh. Should I go grab my laptop? <laughs> I mean, it's not the end of the world if it's a little bit small. <laughs> okay, so we need a Mac person for this. The green. I like green thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll go with that if you guys don't mind. So just have to crane a little bit over to the left in order to see the slides. But hopefully, hopefully it should work. <laughs> okay, so let me get started. Um, so I just wanted to motivate. So what I'm going to be talking about today is you know application of FreeSurfer and the different types of anatomically informed analysis methods to the study of high resolution fMRI. So I just wanted to motivate this very quickly. You know, it's funny. So Larry told me once that when he first put the, the 7T into Charlestown, people told Larry that he was never going to get EPI to work at such a high field strength. What's ironic is that today, I think that the EPI quality that we get at 7T is actually better than at lower field strengths. And that's because a lot of technologies that we use today, such as the Larry's massively parallel receive coil arrays and strong fast gradient coils, weren't available at, at that time. So here's an example of some 0.75 millimeter isotropic single shot EPI that we got with, we got with my beloved uh, head gradient coil. So this is a Again, you can see very fine anatomical details in these images, but these are the images that we use for our fMRI. Now, when I acquired these data, maybe six, seven years ago, the question was, did it make sense to acquire such small voxels? At that time, the conventional wisdom about the spatial resolution of any kind of hemodynamic-based measure like fMRI was that it would be at about two to three millimeters full of half max. Um, and recently, since then, we've seen often from a lot of our work from our colleagues in optical imaging that the biological point spread function of any hemodynamic-based measure, like fMRI, seems to be much more precise than we, really, than we recently believed. 
And so I think that this is motivating us to push to actually smaller voxel sizes, faster temporal resolution, in order to gain more benefits in terms of neuronal specificity. So just to show you a couple of examples of how optical imaging has really changed our opinion, it changed how we view these hemodynamic signals, here's an example of pericytes in action. So we thought that before the ultimate uh, specificity of any hemodynamic-based measure would be based on the spacing of the arterioles because capillaries have no smooth muscle tissue. What's interesting is that these pericytes are non-neural cells that wrap their appendages around capillaries and are able to dilate. So I love this movie because what you can see here is that there's an electrode kind of stimulating the central pericyte, so the movie's looping. So when that, when that electrode stimulates the pericyte, it constricts, not necessarily surprising, but what's cool is that a moment or two later, you can see that the upstream and downstream pericytes also constrict. Okay, so this is telling us that there's some coordination of blood flow regulation at the capillary level. You can even see the individual red blood cells going through this capillary. So we know that there can be signal propagation along the endothelial cells that comprise the vessel walls. And this is showing us there are mechanisms in place for very local blood flow regulation in the brain. Now, people, when this result first came out, people were a little bit skeptical because these were done in excised tissue where the blood pressure really wasn't at in vivo levels. But the same group went back about a decade later. What they showed was that the, the uh, pericytes can also dilate capillaries in vivo. Now, there was some debate about whether these are really uh, dilating capillaries or uh, dilating the precapillary arterioles, but what we know is that uh, this is indicating to us that the blood flow regulation is much finer in space than we once believed. Now, there's also some nice results looking in the temporal domain. This is nice work from Anna DeVore's group. She looked at calcium dynamics in astrocytes and the dilation of vessels using two-photon microscopy. What she found was that after the neural activity, the astrocytic onset was about three seconds post-stimulus. But what she also saw that uh, the vascular onset, the dilation of the microvessels, was about 0.7 seconds post-stimulus, and sometimes even faster. So not only does this question the role of astrocytes as the relays between neurons and blood vessels, but it also tells us that the vascular onset can be very quick, very temporally precise. So taking these two results together, it's showing us that both in space and in time, the blood flow response in response to neural activity can be much more fine than we once believed. So this is motivating us to push to even smaller voxels, faster acquisitions, higher field strengths, in order to take advantage of this specificity. So I like to think of it as, you know, the vessels are talking to us. We just need to figure out how best to listen. And so what Larry likes to say is that <laughs> the ball is sort of in our court. You know, we have to push to these higher resolutions in order to retain this uh, neuronal specificity in these hemodynamic signals. Okay, but with that, what I'd like to talk about today, a lot of our work is focused on going to smaller voxels, faster acquisitions. But what I'd like to talk about today, given the symposium, is some analysis strategies we apply for high-resolution fMRI. So I'd like to first talk about surface reconstruction approaches for high-resolution fMRI and ask the question, how far can we go with EPI today? And then I'd like to go over some cortical depth analyses of fMRI data and ask, can we improve the sensitivity or specificity of the pulp response? And finally, I'd like to share some potential future directions for intracortical and subcortical analyses. So first, surface reconstruction. So as I pointed out, we have 0.75 millimeter isotropic bowl data today, and th so the question becomes, you know, do we push to kind of higher resolution anatomical imaging as well? Uh, so Marty showed some really nice examples of the cerebellum. So in this case, you know, again, because our voxels are way below the one millimeter isotropic voxel size we typically use in FreeSurfer, we thought, you know, maybe with our high field scanners, we can go to smaller voxels and see if there are any ad ad advantages to these higher resolution data. So this is work from Natalia Zaretskaya. She worked very closely with Bruce in order to go through Recon All and make sure that all of the steps that once assumed one millimeter voxels could work for submillimeter voxels as well. So here are some examples of these reconstructions. I believe this is in FreeSurfer 6, uh, support for high resolution data. We wanted to see whether there'd be any advantages to moving to smaller voxels. So here's an example. What's interesting about these results is that overall, <laughs> you know, the one millimeter kind of um, standard used for free surfer was based on the kind of cortical thickness and cortical folding of the adult cortex. It actually works pretty well. We compared the results from the 750 micron to the one millimeter data. We actually found that the free surfer recons were pretty good. There wasn't much advantage to going to the seven millimeter voxels. They were pretty much accurate on pretty much all of the brain. We saw in some places the cortex was a little bit thinner when we measured it with the millimeter voxels, but only in regions that were more heavily myelinated, like V1 and S1, do we see that the high-resolution data gave us some advantages, especially in kind of anterior V1. So it seems that there are some advantages to going to higher resolutions, but in general, FreeSurfer is doing pretty well. Now, we pushed to slightly higher resolution, smaller voxels. At first, the results didn't look quite so good, but we realized that, of course, there's a big penalty in going to smaller voxels. We were losing a lot of SNR. So here's an example of some 500 micron data that we also processed with the high-res stream and FreeSurfer. If we scan for about an hour, maybe this is a little bit too long, but if we scan for about an hour, there's enough SNR, we're getting beautiful reconstructions from the FreeSurfer high-res pipeline. So we're pretty excited about the potential increases in accuracy that we can enjoy by going to smaller voxels. 
Also, as I mentioned, we put a lot of effort into our EPI data. We thought, well, gosh, you know, we're seeing enough kind of anatomical um, quality in these data. Maybe we could use EPI for anatomical mapping as well. So here's an example of our quantitative T1 mapping with EPI. This is a one millimeter isotropic acquisition over the entire brain acquired in about three minutes at 7T. So this is kind of a simple sequence. All that we do is we play kind of a non-selective inversion pulse. We read out all the EPI slices. So each slice gets a different TI. And then we repeat the non-selective inversion pulse, read out all the slices a second time, but we permute the order. So this time each slice gets a different TI. And if we repeat this enough times, in this case 24, each slice sees 24 inversion times with which we can kind of fit a T1 recovery and generate a quantitative T1 map and separating out the T1 and the T2 star components. So what we can do with this quantitative T1 map is pump it through an MP-Rage simulator. Actually, we're using some of Anders' old uh, MATLAB code for this, uh, <laughs> similar free server. Um, so we can generate uh, an API with mp rage like contrast, which we can then pump into FreeServer, oops, in order to generate um, automatic cortical surface reconstructions and subcortical parcellations directly from API data. And again, this is at seven Tesla. We also wanted to show that we could use it at three Tesla as well, you know, to expand the application base. So here you can see again, one millimeter isotropic data. This is EPI data acquired at three Tesla that we pumped through FreeServer in order to get the surface reconstructions. Now this is one example. I think this took about seven minutes of scan time. I think we could do this faster. I think there's enough SNR to push this to shorter acquisition times. So you may be asking, why bother acquiring EPI? Why bother generating cortical surfaces from EPI data? So I wouldn't uh, you know, advertise this for morphometrics. I think you wouldn't want to measure cortical thickness with these EPI data necessarily. The idea is for fMRI, and one of the biggest challenges is to align the functional data to the structural data because there are distortions in the functional data. This is one of the most challenging steps in our fMRI processing. So the idea here is we can generate surfaces from EPI data with the exact same readout that we use for our fMRI data so that the anatomical data and the functional data are exactly distortion matched. So you may ask, well, why don't we just perform a distortion correction? Well, we could do that. Uh, there are t many methods for unwarping the EPI data, but all of them what have in common is that they cause resolution loss due to the interpolation needed during the unwarping process. That's because the unwarping requires some interpolation, which causes resolution losses due that are actually a function of the voxel sizes. So what you can see here is that I'm showing two maps. This is the induced blurring imposed by the unwarping process caused by the interpolation. So we're spending so much time and energy getting to our small voxels, we don't want to throw away that resolution during the pre-processing stages. So the idea here is that we can get surfaces from anatomical data that is the exact same distortion as our functional bold images. Now, one other point I'd like to point out, and that is, you know, while we know that the low bandwidth direction in EPI is along the phase encoding, so we actually get most of our distortion along the phase encoding direction, but as we go to thin our slices, we're actually seeing lower bandwidths in the slice direction as well. You can see this very nicely. If we alternate the slice select gradient polarity, you can get a sense for the amount of distortions in the slice direction. This is work by Anna. You can see here very nicely that as we toggle the sliced encoding direction, you can see how much, how much distortion there is in this direction as well. And most distortion correction techniques don't take this into account. So this is yet another reason why we want to get EPI data that are anatomical, have anatomical quality that are distortion matched to our fMRI data. Okay, so next I'd like to talk a little bit about cortical depth analyses. So as I said, we have these small voxels now. These enable us to think of the cortex not as a two-dimensional sheet, but as a full three-dimensional structure. So this also enables different types of analyses to exploit these small voxel sizes. One of the tricks we can play is we can exploit the different spatial scales of vascular anatomy. As many of you know, there are these large peel veins on the cortical surface that drain deoxygenated blood from large cortical domains. We also have these diving venules that penetrate uh, perpendicularly into the cortex and this randomly oriented capillary bed here in the parenchyma. So the idea is that we can exploit this regularity of the vascular organization by looking at taking some of our small voxels and only considering bold signals from within the parenchyma, where presumably the spatial coupling between the bold signal and the neural activity is the tightest. At the same time, we can sort of exclude voxels that are sampling from the peel surface where we know that uh, these bold signals are going to be less spatially specific because they're coming from these large draining vessels. So in order to try to test out this idea, we use the concept of retinotopy. I don't need to say much about retinotopy for this crowd. I will point out for Marty, this is a kind of a fun cartoon. It seems that, you know, this is drawn in the 70s before we had any idea of the human retinotopic mapping. This looks a little bit more like cat to me, <laughs> uh, but the point is that I like this cartoon, kind of conveys the idea, but kind of shows also how far we've come in terms of our understanding of the quantitative properties of these maps. 
So for this analysis, we performed a cortical depth analysis. This is actually a tool that Bruce wrote originally for uh, anatomical data, I think for the ex vivo data that we applied in this case to fMRI. So what we do here is very simple. We take that gray white surface that Bruce had mentioned this morning, evolve it out to the peel surface, but just save intermediate surfaces at various cortical depths. In this case, we generated a family of nine intermediate surfaces plus the two boundary. Uh, these are the cross sections of the surfaces shown overlaid on the MB range. And for this analysis, we simply ident identify EPI voxels that intersect each of these surfaces. So in this analysis, we generate one surface model per depth. This enables us to perform a laminar analysis over large expanses of folded cortex. So for our resolution stimulus, uh, we use this principle of retinotopy in order to uh, uh, elicit a pattern of activation that is in the desired shape of this letter M. And all that we did was we calculated the required shape that we'd have to present to the stimulus in the visual field in order to elicit this pattern of activation. And this is derived by kind of a simple uh, kind of formal mapping. This is a log map. Uh, this was first proposed by my PhD advisor, Eric Schwartz, who's mentioned this morning. I should point out that, um, as Bruce had mentioned this morning, Bruce and Doug also were working with Eric, and I think they're no strangers to these log maps. And I've been meaning to ask you, I saw in the FreeSurfer repository, there's still some log map code, uh, at least deep, deep, deep in the directory structure. I think that there's still log maps lurking in, in FreeSurfer somewhere. Uh, but the point is, this is a very effective mapping in order to generate stimuli that can give us known patterns of activation on the cortical surface. So here's the stimulus. We flip it because the retina inverts the image. We present an M in the left and right hemifields. We contrast this noise-filled M with, on a gray background with a gray-filled M on a noise background. So here's the activation in the individual slice. It's kind of tough to see the activation here, but as I said, we just identify fMRI voxels that intersect this family of intermediate surfaces across the cortex and simply sample these C statistics as a function of cortical depth. So this is a movie that Bruce also suggested that I generate to kind of demonstrate how well you can see uh, the activation pattern of the M on the cortical surface. It's really tough to see it in the original folded configuration. It's kind of tucked within the calcarin, but if you inflate the surface, you can much better visualize the pattern of activation. Again, this is because the surface gives us a nice representation that captures the two-dimensional topology of this topographic mapping. But again, the point of this experiment was to investigate the depth dependence of spatial accuracy. So if we sample the pattern near to the white matter surface away from those large draining vessels, we see that the pattern of activation comes out quite clearly. But as we progressively and systematically sample closer and closer to the peel surface, the spatial fidelity of that pattern breaks down systematically. And I think in an interesting way. Uh, this is one of my favorite artifacts. You can see that there might be a peel vessel that's sort of cutting off the top corner of this M. So what we see is that the resolution pattern degrades with as we sample closer and closer to these peel vessels. Also note that the resolution really isn't well characterized by a zero mean point suit function. Also note that it's not as if the pattern that we measure near to the peel surface is kind of a isotropically smoothed version of the pattern that we see near to the white matter surface. This makes sense, our voxels are small and they're much more sensitive to local details of the vascular anatomy. So I just wanted to point out that what this analysis is kind of analogous to uh, the technique that, was, that Marty had also mentioned this morning that was kind of uh, pioneered by Roger Tuttle. I guess Marty called it the, um, the Flat Cortex Society, <laughs> um, in which they kind of heroically kind of uh, flattened this unfixed tissue into the plane, flat mounted it, and did a tangential, tangential sectioning. So this is early work from Roger in which he was demonstrating the activation pattern. This is the kind of famous uh, zebra stripe ocular dominance column pattern. So this is akin to, again, taking like one section through the cortex. If you look in the other direction across the different cortical layers, you can see these columnar patterns kind of extending across all the layers of the cortex. And what Roger did was sort of heroically kind of section uh, this flat mounted tissue in order to see this pattern across different cortical depths. It's kind of akin to what we're doing um, again, this tangential sectioning allows us to see how the columnar pattern varies across depths. Again, today, instead of doing this with physically flattening the tissue, we're able to perform this uh, in the fMRI data uh, using the tools uh, given to us by FreeSurfer. So Roger and Shaheen have taken this a few steps further. This is nice work looking at the same ocular dominance column stripe pattern across V1. Um, so in this case, again, so what Sheen did was he take, took advantage of the fact that now that we have isotropic, small isotropic voxel sizes and the surface-based analysis, we can look at these columnar patterns over large expanses of the folded cortex. I think that in, in the past, people were constricted to only looking at these columnar patterns with fMRI and small, locally flat patches of tissue. Uh, so Shaheen and Roger have taken this a few steps further, looking at columnar systems outside of the visual uh, primary visual cortex into extrastriate cortex. In this case, V2 columns, the so-called color-selective uh, thin stripes. You can see this uh, columnar pattern sort of emanating perpendicularly from the V1-V2 boundary. 
But again, if we perform this cortical depth analysis, you can see that if we, if we sample this pattern near to the, the superficial surface, near these large training vessels, the pattern, the kilometer pattern isn't very distinct. But as we sample deeper and deeper into the cortex, away from those large training vessels, the pattern appears much more clearly. And what's exciting is that previously people have looked at kilometer systems in order to sort of test the resolution of fMRI. But Shaheen is taking this one step further. He's using these columns to define regions of interest in which he's able to sort of drill down deeper and kind of interrogate the functional architecture within these modules. So here's some examples looking at both V2 and V3. He's seeing that in the thick type columns, he sees a preference for kind of lower spatial frequencies. And in the thin type columns, he's seeing preferences for higher spatial frequencies. I think this is very exciting. Also, we've been able to exploit this depth analysis to test the specificity of different types of bold fMRI. Uh, we know that T2-based bold fMRI is supposedly more sensitive to extravascular changes around microvessels at higher fields. So this is some data that we acquired at 9.4 Tesla in a human. In this case, instead of using an M, we used kind of a little plus sign. We compared kind of a standard gradient echo API with SSFP, which is thought to have more microvascular weighting. So the hypothesis here was that as we sample across depths, we would expect the SSFP would be sort of more uniform across depths, whereas we expect the gradient echo API to have a sort of breakdown near the field surface. But what we found was that they actually both break down. The, the plus sign gets blobby in both acquisitions. And so we kind of scratched our heads a little bit. We know that the SSFP is able to refocus these large extra, extravascular signals around the macrovasculature. And therefore, we thought it was only sensitive to extravascular signals around the microvasculature. But I think what's going on here is that it's so effective at this refocusing that we're also refocusing signal in the intravascular compartment. So we're actually getting intravascular signal in the small vessels and the big vessels. So the idea is that this analysis, because to first order, most of the big vessels are at the surface, just by investigating how these bold signals vary across depths, we can get some insight into their vascular contributions. And also, I just wanted to briefly point out another application. This is work from Yerke. Uh, so what Yerke was doing is a similar kind of depth analysis. He excluded voxels intersecting the peel surface and showed that this improved the alignment across subjects in his group level maps. So this is another nice example of how excluding these, this peel vasculature, if you have small enough voxels, can improve the accuracy of the measurements. And so finally, I just to share a couple of uh, future directions. Uh, so as uh, Doug had mentioned you know, this morning, now that we have uh, small isotropic voxels in these family of surfaces, this enables new anatomically informed smoothing strategies. So depending on our priors of the activation pattern, say we're looking at a laminar activation or a columnar activation, or something maybe more, a little bit more conventional, intracortical activation, we can also look at kind of restricted activations in which we kind of eliminate any contamination from CSF, which is a big noise source. We can also eliminate any signal dilution from the white matter. Again, constraining the smoothing to only lie within the surface can potentially give us some advantages. And not only that, but also reduce some of the specificity losses that I showed you previously. So here's some results. So what Anna has been looking at is uh, both resting state and visual stimuli. What she did was compared the TSNR and Z stats measured from kind of a conventional three millimeter isotropic acquisition. And what she found was that if she took one millimeter data and smoothed it conventionally using kind of a volume-based smoothing kernel, as uh, you know, Doug had mentioned today, there's uh, some gains in TSNR and in Z-stats in these data, but it's not as much TSNR or Z-statistics as we see in the conventional. However, if she performed this intracortical analysis, you know, again, restricting the smoothing to be within the cortical ribbon and also excluding the peel vasculature and uh, the white matter surface, not only did she find uh, an increase in the TSNR, but also an increase in the Z-statistics as well. Okay, so what this tells us is that small voxels and, and kind of the anatomically informed smoothing can provide us with more TSNR and more sensitivity. And so what I think that one potential future direction here might be, just like with FreeSurfer, we tend to use one millimeter voxels for our MP ranges for the anatomical data because these sort of adequately sample the cortex. I think it makes sense now that now that we see that this anatomically informed sampling of the fMRI data can also provide more SNR, more sensitivity. I think there's a case to be made for also for our functional data going to one millimeter voxels, basically the smallest voxels that you can afford you know, do a, perform an anatomically informed smoothing, even if you're not interested in columnar or laminar activation, I think there's great advantages to going to smaller voxels that adequately sample the cortex and performing this anatomically informed smoothing. And finally, I just wanted to wrap up by telling you a little bit about some of our current work. We're also trying to, as I said, to first order, most of the big vessels are on the peel surface, but these diving venules are also relatively large, and we can't really necessarily get rid of them using these techniques. And so right now, we're looking at methods to eliminate uh, the diving vessel uh, contributions as well. Um, so far, it's looking pretty promising. 
Uh, also note that you know, the cell density and vascular density tends to be sort of correlated. There tends to be high vascular density in the same locations where there's high cell density, especially in the central cortical layers. So not only does this, the diving vessels potentially contribute coupling of the bolt signal across layers, but sometimes the varying vascular density can also cause biases in our signal detection. And what's interesting also is that not only does the vascular density vary across depths, but it varies quite a lot across the cortex. Here's an interesting example in which you can see the capillary density, the V1, V2 boundary, sharpening, uh, dropping, sharpening, <laughs> sharply dropping at this functional boundary. And just one last thought, I'd, mostly this is just an excuse to show this, uh, this image, which I think is really cool. I think I showed this to you, Marty, recently. This is a, um, a vascular uh, density map of the lateral geniculate nucleus. So not only is the kind of microvasculature very strongly correlated to the microanatomical details in the cortical gray matter, but here in the subcortical structures as well, you can see, you know, if you squint, you can see the six layers of the LGN in this vascular density map. So we see that there's a very strong alignment between the microvascular anatomy yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? And we also see that uh, these draining vessels are also present in the ventral surface. We think that some of these same ideas of anatomically informed analysis, knowing where the vessels are, can also improve the specificity of our fMRI in the subcortical structures as well. Uh, so with that, I'd like to just wrap up and say that, so I told you, I showed you about how anatomically informed sampling can improve the accuracy of our high resolution fMRI experiments. I've shown you how it can also be a useful tool for understanding the vascular influences in various measures of bold fMRI. I've shown you how small voxel fMRI allows the cortex to be really treated as, as a three-dimensional structure, and how smoothing restricted to the gray matter can yield higher uh, sensitivity, even you know, when compared with conventional fMRI. And as I mentioned, you know, we're still motivated to push to acquisitions with higher spatial temporal resolution and sensitivity, which we think that based on what we know about the local blood flow regulation, both in space and in time, can yield uh, in further improvements in neuronal specificity in our hemodynamic-based measures. So with that, I just wanted to quickly thank some of the people who contributed slides, especially uh, Villa, Anna, uh, Yurki, uh, Shaheen, and Natalia. I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators and mentors, especially Larry, Bruce, and Bruce. Also, I'd like to thank Marty for all of his support over the years, and uh, thank you for your attention.